Well, this morning we're beginning our series about the miracles that Jesus performed and as recorded in the book of John. So we're going to be spending the next few weeks in the book of John. Next week, Johan is going to continue this series for us. So stick around for the month of July. It's going to be a really great time of diving in together. There are seven miracles that we read about in this book where Jesus encountered a situation and chose to either help or heal people using supernatural methods. And the purpose for these miracles was to point to the fact that Jesus really was who he said he was. These miracles were really signs pointing to the true identity of Jesus, which is why this is the title of our series. The first miracle happened at a wedding. And before we get into that, I thought I would share just a few uh, kind of tidbits from our own wedding day, Johan and I. Um, Now, when I look back on the day... I have wonderful memories, and I cherish all the photos. However, it was not all sunshine and rainbows, let me tell you. I remember we woke up early, the girls and I, to start getting ready because the photographer was going to come and take photos of us before the ceremony. Now, I know the guys had a nice sleep in, right, because that's how it works. They were just, you know, having this wonderful time, getting lots of sleep. So we were rushing to get ready, and as we're getting ready, I get a call from the photographer. She was on her way to meet us, and she got lost. Oh no, she was totally and completely lost, didn't know where she was. So we were at my parents' acreage getting ready, and their address, of course, didn't appear on Google Maps. So you couldn't search it and find your way through Google Maps. So this poor photographer is using her handwritten map to try to find her way to this place that we are at. And she's gotten turned around. So we're waiting and we're waiting and we're waiting. And have you ever been in a conversation with someone and they're talking and you know they're talking, but you're not really listening because you're watching the clock the whole time and you're like, "Uh uh-huh, yeah, mm mm-hmm. And you have no idea what they just said. That was me the whole morning. (laughs) I just, I was so distracted. Thankfully, the photographer ended up showing up, and it was not their fault at all. They were doing the best they could. So we were able to get a few photos, and then it put us a little bit behind to get to the ceremony. So we piled in the car, and we drove to the ceremony. And I remember looking out the window of the car on the way to the ceremony and just seeing this massive storm cloud outside of the window and thinking, oh, no, are you kidding me? And now I can neither def- I can neither confirm nor deny this, so just the record is straight here, but we may have exceeded the speed limit just a little bit, trying to get ourselves to the ceremony before the rain started. can neither confirm nor deny. And all throughout the ceremony, we could hear rain and hail just pounding on the roof of the church. And I'll never forget, as the pastor was sharing his message, right when he said the word God, this huge thunderclap just boom, and everyone just erupted in laughter because it was like, are you kidding me? Like, what's the odds of the timing there? So, so that's just a little snapshot into what our wedding day was like. There was ups and downs, but it was a wonderful time. And today we're talking about what happened when Jesus went to a wedding with some of his closest friends, the disciples, and his mom, Mary. I know we have some kids with us here in the service today, and so I'm kind of curious, show of hands, Who out of our kids today has been to a wedding before? Up high, nice and proud. Okay, so a couple. Oh, a few more. Awesome. Okay, so you guys know all about this. You're like, yeah, weddings, I've been there. Awesome. Well, we're going to look at the Bible today, and if you don't have a physical Bible today, or if you prefer to use your device, you can download the Bible app and read from there. The Bible app is available on both the Apple App Store and Google Play Store, so whichever camp you're in, there's no fighting here. Everyone can download it. Just search the Bible app and install it to your device, and then you can look up the book of the Bible, the chapter, and the verse, and the translation that you would like to read. So to find this account of Jesus at the wedding, we're going to look, like I said, to the book of John. Now, John is one of the, first go- the, one of the four Gospels, which are the first four books of the New Testament. One of the questions we need to ask when we are reading the Bible is, what kind of book am I reading here? There are poetic books in the Bible, which we need to read kind of like we would read poetry nowadays. we got to remember that there's a lot of figurative language there, so we're not taking it all literally. 
And then there are letters, which are literally handwritten letters addressed to specific people for a specific purpose, like if we were reading somebody's email today. The Gospels are narratives, so they are first-hand accounts of the life, ministry, and teachings of Jesus. We're going to look at this book, John, which was named after the man who wrote it. And the word gospel just really means good news. So this book, the gospel according to John, is really the good news according to John. When we read the Bible, we always need to ask ourselves, who wrote this and what were they like? Well, John was a key leader in the early church. He was also one of the disciples of Jesus, which means he was one of his closest friends. Before we get into what John wrote about his experiences with Jesus, I want to mention that by all human judgment, John was kind of an unlikely choice for Jesus to have in his close friend group. Because he was a fisherman, John seemed maybe like an unlikely pick for Jesus, but Jesus saw what was in John's heart and asked him to follow him. So if you're listening today and you feel like maybe you've done or said things that have disqualified you from being close to God, you just need to know today that God loves you and he accepts you as you are. You need to know that we love you as well. Everyone belongs with Jesus. Another question we should ask ourselves when reading the Bible is, what's the big idea here? What's the main point that the author wants us to grab a hold of? One of the main themes that John comes back to again and again in his gospel is this idea of trusting in Jesus. For John, there's a difference between just hoping that Jesus is God and trusting that he is. John didn't believe in Jesus just because of the blind hope that Jesus was maybe telling the truth. Remember, John was a fisherman by trade, and he left his family business behind when he decided to follow Jesus. So this wouldn't have just been a small decision for him. This would have been like a 180-degree shift for him, a total life change in direction. He put his trust in Jesus because of what he saw Jesus do, because he walked with and talked with Jesus on a daily basis. And he wrote this book so that we could also know what Jesus said and did, and so that we ourselves could decide who Jesus, who Jesus is. And John tells us in chapter 20 of his book that the purpose of his writing was so that anyone who, who reads it would come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah and that by believing, that in believing in him, you may have life in his name. And so John is not expecting us to have this blind kind of hope in Jesus, like we would hope that it doesn't rain again this afternoon or we hope that the weather's going to be sunny this week. John is inviting us to stop, to reflect, and to ask questions about Jesus. He's hoping that if we consider what he experienced with Jesus, and if we reflect on what that might mean for who Jesus is, that we would actually come to believe in Jesus, and through that we would experience radical life change. John was absolutely convinced that Jesus wasn't just a man, but that he was God, and that he can change the lives of those who believe in him through the power of his love. John also believed that the way Jesus acted towards people on earth was supposed to actually help us understand more fully how God the Father acts towards people. The way that Jesus loved people when he was on earth is the way that God the Father has loved people for all time. So if you've ever wondered if God is really good or not, or if God is really loving or not, the best place to find answers to those questions is to look at how Jesus behaved when he was on earth. He reached out with love to those who were outcast. He elevated those who were put down. And the people who were ridiculed and made fun of, he treated them with kindness and with respect. So with that in mind today, we're going to do something a little bit different. Normally, I would read from the Bible, and then we would uh, read it together and continue on with our talk, but I know we've got some kids with us today, so we are actually going to watch an animated video that's going to tell us the story of what happened that day at the wedding. And hey, you're never too old for a cartoon, hey? Can I get an amen? <laughs> awesome. So we've got that video ready, and uh, why don't we watch that together? Stories of the Bible. Jesus turns water into wine. This is Jesus. Hey who is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. Jesus was born in Bethlehem and grew up in Nazareth 
where he grew in wisdom and favor with God oh, I see. and man. One day, Jesus, his disciples, and his mother went to a wedding in Cana. In the middle of the party, the wine ran out. Uh-oh. So Jesus' mother, Mary, told him, they have no more wine. Ah. Jesus replied, dear woman, that's not our problem. My time has not yet come. Excuse me. But Mary told the servants, do whatever he tells you. Standing nearby were six stone water jars. The Jews used jars like these in their washing ceremony. Jesus told the servants, fill the jars with water. Yeah, okay. When the jars had been filled, he said, now dip some out and take it to the master of ceremonies. So the servants did what Jesus told them to. When the master of ceremonies tasted the water that was now wine, not knowing where it had come from, Though, of course, the servants knew. He called the bridegroom over. A host always serves the best wine first. Then, when everyone has had a lot to drink, he brings out the less expensive wine. But you have kept the best until now. This miraculous sign in Cana in Galilee was the first time Jesus revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Awesome. I love how Jesus says, hey <laughs> It's my favorite part. Awesome. So Jesus attends this wedding with his disciples, and his mother Mary is there as well. And so it's reasonable for us to, to conclude that the couple getting married here at the wedding were relatives of Jesus' family. So it's important that we understand what weddings were like in Jesus' day. Context is everything when we're reading the Bible. A typical wedding would begin with a procession of bringing the, the bride to the groom's home. And then there would be a wedding supper and a week of festivities. Yes, you heard that right, a week. Now, ladies in the room who have planned your own wedding, can you imagine planning a week-long wedding? I think I probably would have pulled all my hair out. <laughs> you can imagine the burden that this celebration would have been on the families for the happy couple. The groom in particular was responsible for the wedding expenses, and hospitality was an essential part of society at that time. And so if the wine runs out, it's horribly embarrassing. Now, I think it's safe to say that we all know of wedding horror stories. If it hasn't happened to you, it's happened to somebody else, right? Somebody spills something and stains the wedding dress, or the bride slips on her way down the aisle. Family members get in a fist fight in the middle of the reception. Oh my goodness, what are we going to do? But that's kind of what running out of wine was at the wedding was like. It was a desperate situation. At the very least, the groom's family would have been disgraced for a very long time for allowing this to happen. There could also be legal issues because the bride's family could actually sue him for bringing shame upon them. And so at this point, it's safe to say that tensions were running very high. And Jesus' mother Mary, who probably had some responsibility in planning the wedding, decides to go to Jesus. But here's the interesting thing about Mary's decision. Jesus had yet to perform any miracles up until this point. In other words, to everyone else, he was just some guy. A nice guy for sure, but just some guy. He was the village carpenter. Nothing too special. But that's not how Mary saw him. You know, if you're familiar with the story of Jesus' birth, sometimes we call it the Christmas story, you might remember that an angel appeared to Mary before she became pregnant with Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. And the angel told her three things. First, that even though she was a virgin, she was going to give birth to a son. Second, that she should name the child Jesus. And third, that he would be the son of God. This would have been incredible news for Mary. Pretty mind-blowing, to say the least. And I can't help but wonder what was going through Mary's mind in that moment, right? I'm sure there was a part of her that was just shocked, like jaw down on the floor, shocked. I'm sure there was probably a part of her that was a little bit afraid of what the future might hold for her. But I also wonder if there was kind of this strange sense of peace that she felt in her heart as well, because she trusted that the angel was telling the truth. She definitely didn't know exactly how it was all going to play out, she wasn't sure exactly what the future might hold, but she believed that God was going to do incredible things through her son. 
And so now, fast forward many years to the day of this wedding, and Mary finds herself in this predicament. What are we going to do? She knows the tensions are running high, and she understands the gravity of the situation. And she chooses to go to Jesus for help. Now, as I was preparing for this talk this week, I couldn't help but wonder what on earth was Mary expecting him to do? I mean, they run out of wine and she goes to the carpenter for help. What's he going to do? Is he going to build something? Like, I don't know. What's he going to do? But remember, she's never seen him perform a miracle before. None of them had. But still she asks asks him for help, believing that he will have some kind of a solution for them. And Jesus responds to her in a really curious way. He says, dear woman. And in the original language, it's literally translated woman. Now, can you imagine if you address your mother this way? I would not recommend it. Do not do this. Don't tell them that I told you to do this. Don't do it, okay? But what we're missing here is the English, in the English translation, is what we call the cultural context. So when Jesus says woman, it's more like he would say my lady nowadays. So it's very formal. He's addressing his mom in a public setting, so he's using a formal title. And then he says, that's not our problem. My time has not yet come. In other words, mom, I have a mission here. I've come to save the world, not just to save these people's wedding. And, you know, I like to think in these kind of moments, what would Jesus' face have looked like? You know, I kind of imagine he's got this soft smile on his face as he's looking at his mom, and he can just see the stress there, right? And she's like, come on, give me something, you know? And I can just see that smile and that kind of twinkle in his eye. And then Mary tells the servants, do whatever he tells you. Hmm. And then I just imagine her walking away with this grin on her face, because she's the mom, right? And she knows that her resourceful son will figure something out. She doesn't know what it is, but he's going to figure something out. And before we go any further, we just need to kind of zoom back out from the story for a minute and just ask ourselves this very important question. What on earth is the significance of all of this? I mean, this is a weird scenario to read about in the Bible, right? People's wedding issues? Come on. But remember that John was there that day at the wedding. And John wrote this eyewitness account down for us to read so that we could decide for ourselves about who Jesus was. So if all of this is true, then what about this particular experience was so significant that John included it in his gospel, his book of good news? Well, the answer to that question becomes clearer if we look at the next part of what Jesus does next. So let's look at that. So Jesus says that there are six stone water jars which were used for Jewish ceremonial washing. Each of them could hold 20 to 30 gallons of water, okay? So these are big jars. And so Jesus tells the servants, fill the jars with water. And when the jars have been filled, he says, okay, now dip some out, take it to the master of ceremonies. And the servants follow his instructions. I mean, what else are they going to do? They are at the end of their rope right now. They will try literally anything. The stone water jars, um, the significance here is that the stone water jars were this common household item for Jews at the time. Jews were required by religious law to perform these ceremonial washings before they did certain things so they could remain clean. And so you can imagine these huge stone jars, remember 20 to 30 gallons of water, everyone knows what they're used for, and Jesus chooses to use those to figure out the situation and bring a solution. These ceremonial jars represented the very religious traditions that Jesus had come to replace. Jesus decides to go public, so to speak, to reveal who he really is by using something that would soon be replaced to point to what would soon be put into place. The religious traditions pointed to a temporary sort of arrangement that God had made with the Jewish people, and this arrangement was coming to an end. This arrangement had kind of a timer on it, so to speak. It was good when it was put in place, but it wasn't meant to last forever. 
And so Jesus decides to use these jars, which are so symbolic of these traditions passed down through generations and generations, to point to someone that no one could really understand or might wrap their minds around who was at the wedding that day. That God's temporary arrangement, or sometimes we use this word covenant, with his people was going to be replaced with something new that had come, or someone new that had come, and that someone was Jesus. Before Jesus arrived on the scene, people had to be ceremonially clean before they could be in God's presence. There was always this sort of barrier between people and God. But Jesus had come to break down that barrier and make a way for everyone, for people like me and like you, to experience a closeness with God that had never been seen before. And so the, the jars were filled with water like they had been many, many times before. But this time was different. Imagine the shock of the servants when they dipped into one of the jars and they found that the water had been turned into wine. They'd filled those jars themselves. They knew what had gone into the jars. It had happened right before their eyes. And so they bring that cup to the master of ceremonies. And master of ceremonies would have been just like an MC at one of our weddings here today. You know, he would have decided what was served, what was, uh, when it was served, and who it was served to, kind of organizing all of that. And when he tasted the water that was now wine, not knowing where had it come from, although the servants knew and they're thinking, oh my goodness, he calls the bridegroom over, the groom. He says, a host always serves the best wine first. Then when everyone has had a lot to drink, he brings out the less expensive wine. But you, you have kept the best until now. And you know his wheels, the wheels in his head are just turning. And God had saved the best as well. Because just like the original wine had been had just like the original wine had been served before the new wine at the wedding, this temporary arrangement between God and his people had actually set the stage for the world to anticipate someone to come after it and to fulfill it in a way that had never been seen before. And Jesus was the fulfillment of that arrangement in every way. There was nothing wrong with what had come before him, but what had come before him was meant to set the stage for him. What happened at the wedding that day was more than a miracle. It was more than saving the butt of the groom and getting him out of that pickle. This was a sign. It was a sign that points to who Jesus is, that he is God. The leader in this chapter, Jesus writes that after the disciples saw what Jesus did at the wedding, they believed in him. They put their trust in him. They could, not, they could see what he had done, and they may not have fully understood the whole scope of what he was trying to communicate, but they had seen enough to put their trust in him. And so what John is offering to us today as we read this book is really just an opportunity to believe that what he wrote down really happened, and to believe that Jesus really is who he said he is. And now you may be thinking to yourself, why does it matter to John what I believe today? Why does he care? And here's why. In the next chapter, John writes this, For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but will have eternal life. This was Jesus' mission on earth. This is why he lived a perfect life. He died on the cross and then he rose again three days later so that everyone would have an opportunity to believe what he had to say, to hear the good news, and to receive God's love into their lives. You know, God's love is unlike any earthly love that we can experience. It doesn't run out. It doesn't have an expiration date. It's not conditional. It's not fickle or fragile. It's eternal, it's long-lasting, and it's long-suffering. And it's available to anyone who wants to receive it. It can be difficult for us to really wrap our minds around what God's love means for us. Our human experience of love is so fragile. It's often conditional, and it's rarely long-lasting. And many of us from a very young age start to learn the realities of human limits. 
We see the mistakes of our parents, and we get hurt by them. We get into romantic relationships with people who are hurting, and they end up hurting us. And along the way, whether consciously or subconsciously, we start to believe that God might be the same way. And if you're here today or you're listening online and you've experienced what I've just described, I think most of us have, if not all of us, I want to invite you today to just take this moment to pause and reflect. What has your experience with God been like? Maybe you've never really given God much thought because he's kind of seemed like really distant to you, if you're honest. Or maybe you've been through a lot of hurt and a lot of hard times in your life and you're kind of wondering, well, where is he? Show me where he is, because I don't see him. Or maybe you've had regrets in life and you feel like maybe there will always be that wall between you and God because of the choices that you've made. You know, Jesus came to break down those barriers that exist between God and people. He came to make a way for us to experience closeness with God so that we could come to God just as we are and experience his love regardless of the mistakes that we've made in our lives. So wherever you are at with God today, the invitation for us is the same. To discover who Jesus is, that he loves you, that he cares for you, and that he wants to be in close relationship with you. That's why John went through all the trouble of writing all this stuff down. Spending time with Jesus actually changed John's life forever. And he was convinced that it could change the life of anyone who believed in him. You know, I just want to be honest with you for a minute and share a little bit about my own experience. As I've spent time with Jesus and grown in my relationship with him, I've realized that I can actually come to him just as I am. And that has been a huge journey for me. When I was growing up, I really struggled with a sense of perfectionism. Whatever that sense of being perfect, whatever definition that was. And I had this sense that I needed to measure up to a certain standard or else I just wouldn't be good enough. This wasn't a pressure that really came from other people. It was really just something that I put on myself. But it wasn't until I realized that God wasn't expecting me to be perfect, that I didn't have to measure up to any standard for him to love me, that I was able to really receive God's love in a life-changing way. Spending time with Jesus has changed the way that I see myself and the way that I see God. And that's why Jesus is the only way for me. You know, we've talked about this idea of trusting in Jesus today. And I just want to say very clearly as we close that if you are here today and you're not really sure about the idea of trusting in Jesus, that is okay. It's okay to have questions and it's okay to have doubts. This place here was literally built for you. Our church was designed to help you to navigate these hard questions. Jesus actually wants us to ask the tough questions and to look to him for the answers. Ultimately, he wants us to get to know him better and to grow our roots down deeper and deeper into his love so that we can find that inner security that comes from knowing that he loves us unconditionally. And let me say as well, if you feel like you don't know a lot about Jesus and you're trying to figure these things out, but you do feel that sense in your heart that there's something drawing you to Jesus, all you have to do is trust him with your life. That's all he asks of any of us just to trust him, regardless of what we think we know or what we don't feel we know. If you're listening today or you're watching online and you've been kind of exploring this idea of faith of Jesus, I want to invite you to consider to begin a relationship with him today and just receive his love into your heart today. Or if you're at that place where you feel you might be ready to do that, I'm going to pray in a few minutes and you can let my words be your words in that moment. And maybe you're here today or you're watching online and you're kind of in this situation where you feel like the wine has run out. In a sense, there's there's something in your life that you don't have the answers for. You're not sure what to do. And if that's you today, I want to encourage you. Mary had the problem at the wedding that day and she went to Jesus. 
And that's how he, uh, Jesus responded to Mary in that moment with empathy and with love. And that's how he responds to us today when we go to him with whatever's weighing heavy on our hearts. You know, prayer is simply just talking to Jesus, talking to God. It isn't about being a good speaker or using good words, big words. It's more about what's just going on in your heart. So if you're in a place today where you're needing help from God with a very real and immediate situation, just let him know that. It can be as easy as just saying, Jesus, I need your help. I'm not sure what to do. Please show me the way forward and help me to trust you. Maybe a situation in your family or in your workplace, and you just feel like your back is against the wall. You're not sure what to do. Whatever it is, you can talk to God about it, even right now in this moment. And if there's something weighing heavy on your heart today, maybe your next step is to just bring that to God and be honest with him about your, how you're feeling. He's waiting with open arms for anyone who chooses to run to him. And it's his desire that we would actually walk with him through the difficulties of life. And that as we do that, we would grow deeper in our relationship with him. And that we would become more and more like him in the process. If you're here today and you have a relationship with Jesus already, but you're feeling that kind of hunger deep within you to get to know him more, I want to encourage you in that. There's a few ways that you can get to know Jesus more. The first is just by spending time reading the Bible on a regular basis. A good tool for that is our Bible reading guide. And you can find that on our website, which is whitecourt.church. And download that PDF, or we've always got printed copies at the bulletin board at the back as well. If you haven't incorporated that regular Bible reading time into your routine, I really encourage you to consider doing that today. That might be your next step here. Wherever we are at here with God today, there is a next step for each and every one of us. And it takes time. It takes being with Jesus to, to reflect on what that might be. And so as we close today, will you pray with me? And let's just ask God what that might be together. God, I thank you for each one here and each joining us online. And God, we know that we are each on a journey with you in different places in our faith. And God, thank you that you meet us right where we are. Lord, would you show each of us in our hearts just what that next step might be. God, we want to get to know you more. And Jesus, we want to become more like you in the process. And now if you are here today and you are feeling like you might like to invite Jesus into your heart, just let my words be your words. Jesus, I, I invite you into my heart today. Thank you for loving me. Help me to trust you with my life and lead me forward. Amen.